Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the innovation stage for the continuation of our program. Another panel discussion, but a completely new, fresh, and exciting topic. We're going to talk about redefining your customers and guests um, in the post-pandemic world. We make an effort not to mention the C word too often, so we resort to terms like post-pandemic and everything. Um, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you the chair of this meeting. I'm standing too close to something. No, it's, I hear a lot of extra sounds. But uh, today you're in the good hands of AJ Kapoor, who's the Bachelor Program Manager of Hotel School de Hague. So, AJ, take it away. I'm looking forward to this uh, nice uh, session uh, with a lively discussion amongst the, us. And um, we will start off in a minute. And uh, oh, am I audible? Just to be sure. No, not. Okay. I don't think people can hear you, so. Um Okay, yes, this uh, sounds better. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, so good afternoon. Um, we'll have this uh, lively discussion of uh, about 45 minutes uh, with the panel members who I'll uh, ask them to introduce themselves in a minute. Um, I look forward to your questions at the end of the session, if, it, if that's okay. And we'll just uh, go and, and dive deep into the uh, topic that we have is the post-pandemic uh, world. Uh, and to think about how guest behavior will be, and of course, how we look at loyalty. Okay, so first of all, um, let me ask you to introduce yourself in, in two sentences. Uh, maybe Mark, start with you. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very nice to be in a, in a big conference again. It's been a while. Uh, my name is Mark van der Hulst. I'm an industry manager for the travel industry at Google. Thank you, Mark. Hi, my name is Henry Robben, and I'm a professor of marketing at uh, Nijenrode Business Universiteit. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Erwin van der Graaf, and I'm Vice President of Operations for Accor Hotels for the Benelux, Switzerland, Austria, and Germany. Okay, thank you, Erwin. So, um, I think one of the things that we want to know is, of course, what are the major trends that are happening post-pandemic, and what do you see forecasting? So, uh, maybe I'll start off with Mark. Uh, you have a globe, it's called the Google Box. <laughs> Tell us. Yes, exactly. So one of the things that we immediately start looking at is the search behavior, obviously, that people are performing in our uh, search engine. And um, yeah, you said that are there a lot of changes and trends? Well, I think that trends, first of all, are um, behaviors that are growing, right? We talk, talked about it a bit earlier. They need to be ex uh, exponentially growing. And one of the trends that we see really happening is that people are looking for uh, good holidays or best holidays instead of uh, cheap holidays. And this trend was already uh, starting uh, before Corona. And at the moment, you see that it has been crossing and that people are really adding a lot more value to uh, high quality holidays. And with uh, a survey we ran uh, late last year, we asked people if they want to, uh, how they are preparing for that. And actually, people and the respondents are, uh, are saying that they are very, very uh, uh, willing to spend more money on high quality uh, holidays. So they're looking for more uh, convenience, but also safety. I think people are really caring a lot about that. Yeah, so, so two important points there, more luxury in, in some way, and also safety. You, you mentioned that at the end. Yeah, that's uh, a good point. So yeah. uh, we see that people are really looking for more safety. Yeah, the C word we can't really mention, but uh, because of the last two years, people are looking for sometimes even hospital uh, great uh, cleanliness in hotels, uh, but also uh, convenience such as uh, uh, very flexible cancellation uh, terms uh, and uh, yeah, more safety measures. Yeah, also the policies. That's right. True. Okay, thank you. Um, Henry, an anything you would like to add? Yes, I think um, if we look at what will be happening in the future, I think there's two things. We have some short-term effects, uh, like uh, people, uh, I think, 
I think hotel owners have to make sure that they have all kinds of arrangements so people indeed feel safe and clean. But I think in the bit longer run, uh, things will go really back to normal because the best predictor of future behavior is, is our past behavior. And our past behavior is mixing and mingling. So that will return. Which we already see today, uh, being at a, uh, a hotel show where it, it's like previously as we know. Yeah. Um, Erwin, um, any um, trends you would like to share? Because I know y your company, Accor, does a lot of uh, research onto this. Uh, please uh, enlighten us. Yeah, we, we published in January our uh, Northern Europe uh, Travel Trends uh, report, and partly it's actually uh, reconfirming uh, what Mark just said. Uh, people are, are desperate to travel again. Um, the good thing for our industry is probably that um, people want to spend more. You say, well, they want to travel like a millionaire. So uh, people, they, they have their travel budgets for this year are roughly 39% above what they were willing to spend in 2019. So they would have more premium experiences. They would book uh, more expensive and more fancy hotels. They would book business class over economy. Uh, I'm speaking about now uh, leisure, uh, leisure guests, of course. Business guests, it's, it's, it's a different cookie. Um, they're not coming back in the amounts yet as we were seeing in 2019. And I think the big elephant in the room is, of course, until what extent will they ever come back? Uh, a certain part will come back, but another part of business travel will not come back. The good thing is that we expect that the growth in leisure travel will have outperformed uh, the, 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 I would say the lack of recovery in business travel by 2023. Okay, but, but you do see a, um, a fallback for the business travel a, as a whole. And are there any other trends that are important for the business market that you uh, keep in account? Well, I would probably say two uh, mega trends. One is planet preservation. I mean, sustainability has been important always. Uh, but I think over the last two years, it's it really emerged. And especially in the, the business travel segment, what we see, for example, today, and this is recent, eh? this is like something we're seeing now for half a year, is that big corporates that are responsible for a big share of business travel, they're not only giving travel budgets to their employees, but they're also giving carbon budgets. So you would get to spend like a thousand euros on the, on the trip, but you would also get to spend a certain carbon credit. So either you can take a flight and book, uh, and book a cheap hotel, uh, either you go by train and you book a fancy hotel. Well, th that's an interesting trend to, to keep in mind and it, it does fit totally of course with uh, more and more companies thinking about the sourcing of, uh, of where they buy in this case um, hospitality um, so yeah it's, it's, it's important for hotels to keep that in mind uh, from the business market yeah definitely uh, Mark you want to add something yeah so uh, the report uh, Erin shared uh, with this group beforehand was really interesting I think and there's a couple of trends that you named uh, for example, in the changed traveling behavior that uh, yeah, Google also recognizes uh, very well. So, for example, we see a lot of different kind of domestic trips. So the increase of domestic trips as soon as there's more the international yeah, turbulence. Uh, we, we saw that, for example, also really strongly. And yeah, that could be, of course, a trend maybe that if people are, yeah, if you say, uh, animals of, of strong habits, uh, they would continue to uh, be traveling also a little bit more domestically. So. It's really curious to see how this will develop uh, if we're a bit more uh, quiet here to come. Yeah, so we have to see how far are people willing to travel, wanting to travel. Uh, I think one of the other trends that we did not mention yet is, is the pleasure travel or, or the work, uh, work yeah, leisure combination. Um, a anybody wants to um, comment on that one? Um, I think it's, as a marketeer, uh, we typically think in segments or in customer groups, but also in products. So you might argue that there will be some uh, travel that will be diminishing, like uh, Emma said, because m f quite a few meetings you can do uh, digitally. So And we found out which meetings we can do digitally, and we found out which meetings we can't do digitally. So my idea would be if, if, if the travel business would focus on that segment, that product, for those meetings where you have to meet uh, physically, that you create arrangements for that. So I, I see some great opportunities there. Yeah, but you talk about opportunities, and, and we already talked a bit about the difference between short-term and long-term changes. Em, and and uh, Henry, you already said, uh, well, we're people of habit, and uh, we'll go back to the old normal. Um, what of the things of the of, of the changes that are happening now will we take along 
into that long-term um, trend? Uh, I can imagine that what we take with us in the long term is that we sh really should distinguish between things we can deal with digitally and things that we should deal with physically. And like Mark said, there may be some extra indulgence in the short term to reward ourselves for our great behavior in the past two years. Okay, I, I hear a bit of the high-tech, high-touch uh, part as well coming in there. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, is that something you recognize as well? Um, looking at a very high-touch company and a high-tech company. <laughs> yeah, all right. So, yeah, of course, um, uh, we see that there are basically the three big trends actually going to are, are happening. One is acceleration of uh, 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 the trends that were already happening, as we saw before, right? So more luxury and more careful traveling. On the second part, it's really there's so much information being thrown at the Internet uh, every day. And uh, especially in times of, uh, of crisis, such as the last two years, we saw the e-commerce sales rising globally with almost 27%. Uh, so we are really trying to find uh, a, a way how to structure this information so the customers can find a way towards their booking. And I think thirdly, privacy is really a big topic. Uh, I mean, I don't have to tell anyone that Google is really working on this and sometimes also in the news ar around it. But also I think consumers are much more aware of it than ever before. It's not only because of what big tech is doing, of what uh, uh, our government is sometimes asking for us in terms of privacy, but I think also people are questioning much more, hey, am I giving my, my, all my details towards this hotel or to this website? Uh, and this is also, I think, uh, people should really be, yeah, this is continuing to go like this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Erwin, um, I know that Accor is a um, traditional hospitality company, but is moving to do more and more. And I know also the, the, the data side is becoming more and more important for you as well. Uh, maybe you would like to comment on... Um, well, obviously, um, if I make a link, for example, to our loyalty program, huh? I mean, our, our loyalty program is our, our mean to communicate with our guests, to, co to communicate directly and not via an uh, OTA. I mean, OTAs are super important, but at the end of the day, the question is also who owns the data? Do we own the guest data so we can, for any visit, uh, we can reach out to the guest? Or don't we have the data? Uh, so yeah, uh, definitely super important. Yeah. And, and, and looking at that data and everything that goes along with that, also with um, maybe from a customer journey perspective or the decision-making model that, uh, that's behind it, um, do we see changes happening there? And, and then I'll first give the word to Mark because I'd like to hear from the practice. Are we having new search words or are we looking at it differently? Uh, and then we'll go to Henry uh, about Yeah, very that. good. Yeah, so the people have often said that the customer journey is sort of like a spaghetti. It's like a mess. People are going every, every kind of direction and it moves everywhere. But Google has been trying to modelize this. And what we really see is that there's one big path from your triggers towards your purchase. It's like a linear line. Uh, only you've been influencing and being exposed by a lot of brands. Uh, who are influencing your choice. So these are usually the top three brands that are like always there, like big hotel chains, for example. So if you would call th three hotel chains, you would immediately name Aqua or Marriott or Hilton because they're really always out there. They're big, they're strong in marketing. Uh, but in the meantime, you want to have triggers that are d influencing your decision. Uh, and we can distinguish those into two parts. One is like uh, the expiration uh, bit of it, and the other one is the evaluation bit. And you're moving as an infinity circle in between those two paths until you have the right triggers to make your uh, decision uh, towards the purchase. And those triggers are really super old triggers. There are uh, 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 triggers such as uh, uh, the power of free, uh, scarcity, uh, social proof. And if you're really tapping into the data of your clients and know what your most valuable clients want, you can ensure that you are using exactly those the, the points that are triggering them or more people like them. Um, and use this in your in your advertising, for example. And with this way, uh, in the auction for the customer who you want to book, you are able to be competitive even as a, uh, a individual hotel with super big players uh, uh, in the market that are people normally exposed to. And we, we call this the messy middle. It's mm. a really awesome name, I think. Yeah. The, the messy middle. Um, that, does it also refer to the fact that uh, people have different um, hats on while they search? Yeah, I think that's a very, yeah. very good point. Uh, if I, I'm, yeah, of course I work in travel, but I'm a traveler myself as well. Uh, tomorrow with my girlfriend, I'm going to France. Uh, we booked yesterday, uh, but in the meantime, I'm also preparing for a, a trip with uh, colleagues 
uh, to our head office in Dublin and I'm maybe also trying to book another trip at the same time. So it's extremely a lot of signals that I'm uh, sort of losing breadcrumbs I'm spreading. Uh, and yeah, you cannot just uh, say, okay, it's a 40 year old uh, white male from Amsterdam. I mean, I'm, I have a lot of heads on at the same time. Thank you. <laughs> Henry, I, I know you have your idea about this as well. Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, what you see in, in these customer journeys is that um, companies assume that we all go through the same customer journey, which is evidently not the case. Uh, they also assume that when, when you become loyal, uh, that you have them for life. But the thing that I find missing in most customer journey studies, but also in many loyalty programs, is that, of course, to have loyal customers is great. They, they stay longer, they buy more, more often, and they are less price sensitive. But what I see missing in, in, in many organizations is that um, loyalty consists at least of two dimensions. You have your behavior, so recurring purchase behavior, but also the conviction of the customer that you're the best brand for them. Now, if you don't know whether the customer is convinced, you may lose them just like that when a uh, competitor arrives at the market. So my plea would be to really uh, investigate why customers are loyal and how can I make them convinced that my brand is the best brand. Uh, may I ask um, what would be a good method to do that, to figure that out? Oh yes, uh, there's a very old method uh, to do that, uh, talk to customers, uh, but not in the regular way, because if you ask people what do you want, they say, well, uh, better, more, cheaper, and that's not information you, ha you can deal with. So what really works is, is a method that uh, my friend and I designed, it's, it's a sort of a focus group uh, method, and that works brilliantly. But don't use questionnaires, don't use one-on-one -on -one because you get rubbish information. Yes, I can imagine that uh, a lot of people might think they want to be eco-conscious about their choices. That's right. Uh, but in reality, uh, it's different. act differently. Yeah, yeah. yeah true. Um, going towards that, that loyalty aspect, uh, Accor has a big loyalty program. Uh, maybe you'd like to give your uh, perception on loyalty. Yeah, of course. I mean, we have a loyalty program with about 60 million uh, members. Accor Live Limitless. But I think you see loyalty programs evolving, eh? not only for Accor, but more in general. If I take a look at the travel business, I mean, I would say in the old days, a loyalty program would be you buy something, you get points, you redeem points on a gift or an upgrade or a drink or whatever. And that's not enough anymore. I mean, uh, the world has evolved, so also loyalty programs need to evolve. So our loyalty program has now become like a travel companion. So it's not only uh, hotel accommodation, which is our core product, but it's also mobility but it's also financial services. It would be attached to a credit card. Um, it, 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 it would be personalization. I mean, uh, as a loyal customer, we would know a lot of you. Um, so we can help tailor making your, your, uh, your journey. Uh, we know what you like, what you don't like. And I think that's well, probably the next level in, in, in loyalty. So it's not only about the financial rewards. Of course, that rem remains important. Eh? People want to be recognize people want to belong people want to be rewarded for coming back to your to your business but at the same time it needs to be more than that yeah and, and that underpins what uh, henry also said mm -hmm. it's it's not only the points and uh, the the behavior right. it's, but it, it's also the the feeling the heart that's that right have for the and, and the concept of, of a travel companion i think it's uh, very nice yep. well, i'm glad you <laughs> agree on this <laughs> um looking uh, a little bit forward to um to, to change of, 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 uh, of loyalty uh, in, in actual behavior uh, because of the pandemic. Is there anything already that we see happening uh, in the hotels maybe from your side, uh, first of all, Erwin? What, 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 I'm, a bit, I'm a bit cautious with my answer, as you see, because uh, we say post-pandemic, but partly we're still in it. Huh? I mean, we're here now all together and that's great. But if you look at other parts of the world, we're not there yet. I mean, if you still want to travel to China, uh, you can't. Whereas we know that China is a big source market for Europe. So, I mean, we probably passed the tipping point, but we're not there yet. So well, yeah. Okay, so, so maybe look at it from a point of view that things have changed rapidly. Yeah. And of course, there's no new crisis, right? The Ukraine yeah. is also a crisis that has an effect. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I, I think there's probably a difference between short term and long term. We see now a surge in the desire to travel again. Uh, we, we like to call it revenge travel. I mean, revenge travel. Yeah, people have been missing missing out on the, uh, you know over the last two years, and I mean, 
travel has become something, you know, like from the Maslow pyramid, it, it's like food and shelter and uh, education and travel. It's it's um, it, it's not a luxury anymore. It's something that people feel they they uh, they deserve it. Yeah, they're uh, entitled and, and to they it. They're entitled yeah. to it. Yeah. So um, that that's what we see in the short term. But at some point, everybody will have spent this money, uh, and we will probably get get back to normal, as you say. Um, what we do see is that as the, 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 what we like to call pleasure. So it's becoming a blend of leisure and business travel. And the, the, the border between both of them is not so clear anymore. I mean, people would go uh, for a couple of days for business, but would, they would still stay over for the weekend. Or they would work in the morning and they go to a museum uh, or shopping in the afternoon. And I mean, with the acceleration of digital techniques that we have seen now over the last two, three years, it's, it's all possible. But it also puts different requirements on, on hotel accommodation because people would stay longer. And I also like to make the connection to what you said about planet preservation. I mean, at some point you cannot keep on buying tickets. Maybe you want to buy a ticket and you stay for a week instead of for three days. Uh, but it will mean that we will probably need to adjust the type of offering we see now a surge in the, I mean, we do not only uh, uh, sell hotel rooms, but we also sell, apar sell apartments and, and villa accommodation. Uh, we see a surge in um, uh, bookings, but also in requests for uh, private housing uh, for long, uh, long stay accommodation. Uh, because if you're staying for a week or two weeks, if you like, somewhere versus two nights, your requirement is different. Yep. And, and so you're saying as a, as a hotel company, you already think about how to adapt to those changes? Um, and, uh, and I'll get back to you on that as well, Erwin, but I would like to give uh, Mark also the word on uh, some uh, tips that you might have for the hotel industry based on uh, the things that you see happening. <coughs> yeah, so uh, I think what, what you really want to do is you want to really uh, be extremely agile, I think, in all your approaches. So uh, maybe it's good to give an example. Uh, I cannot name the name of the client, but I work with a partner uh, a lot, and uh, that partner has a lot of uh, uh, rental accommodations in the Netherlands, but also in, in Germany, Belgium, and Austria. Uh, and when the pandemic really started, uh, the, bo the borders were obviously closed in 2020, uh, and this partner lost about 70% of, uh, of his occupancy uh, rate, uh, which is extremely dramatic, of course, with spring uh, coming up. Um, but he did see that there were still bookings still coming in, and he started doing uh, a little bit more uh, research on them. Uh, I think the panel was the best way, but this was pretty hasty. So, uh, uh, but he figured out that the bookings that were still arriving were people who were uh, booking these accommodations for uh, 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 just working there during the week, or it was a different um, uh, composition of the audio of the group. Uh, so, those people with children or grandparents with uh, kids and their grandchildren. Uh, and there were much more bookings during the weekend and people were asking much more for uh, internet connection. So, obviously, he thought, hey, there's different kind of uh, uh, audiences interested in staying in these parks. And above all, they were all domestically bookings. So there were Dutch people going to Dutch parks. Now normally it was 70% occupied by Germans. So he launched a large campaign uh, with our help uh, uh, to really focus on the domestic, domestic bookings in the Netherlands, but also did the same for Austrian, uh, uh, German and Belgian parks. And uh, this, uh, this way managed to uh, really up his occupancy rates. Uh, and when I last uh, had a call with him, uh, he said, yeah, well, we are still trying to do this much more in the shoulder season to really start focusing on people who are uh, yeah, just living nearby, but are still interested in occupying these this houses. So uh, after all, he had a pretty good 2020, uh, despite the, uh, yeah, the dark days of Corona at the time. So, so you see that uh, it was needed to be agile to, to find new ways to, to find your customers again? Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that you also helped out uh, in this case with, with this specific client. Um, uh, and um, what are other uh, options or, uh, or tips that you give to hoteliers um, in this regard? Yeah, uh, that's very good. Uh, so I think what you really want to do is you want to uh, trust your data. So invest in capturing your data so you know what are your best clients because you want to reach them at the right time with the right message uh, in the right way. And if you do not know what your most valuable clients uh, uh, are worth and how you can find them, what their characteristics are, you cannot launch strong campaigns on them. With Again, with the biases uh, that trigger your purchase, you need to really incorporate this in your messaging. 
and if you trust your data and add the right parameters so you can automate your campaigns, you can focus much more on your creatives. Uh, and this is, I think, what most marketers really like, a lot more than just uh, uh, moving switches in between bids. Uh, so you can really focus on how to really convince your uh, uh, clients to go to your hotel. Well, thank you. Um, Henri, um, listening to what um, Mark says, um, uh, anything you would like to add as a tip for hoteliers uh, to keep in mind? Oh, yes, I think uh, having data is, is beautiful. Uh, but even more important than data are insights. Uh, what is it that drives uh, travelers? What is it that drives business people, uh, individuals? So my idea would be not only to collect, collect the, the uh, digital data, which are a great foundation, but you also have to have the, the, the social data and the individual data of the customer. And I think you can prepare for a couple of segments. There will be people who will be very unconcerned when they travel, and there will be people who are a bit more concerned with their health. So, and I think if you look at, if you get those data, if you get to know those customers who want to have treatment A or B, you can create uh, new packages for them. So data, yes, absolutely. Um, I'm assuming, Erwin, you have a lot of data. <laughs> you have a lot of data. <laughs> oh. one. Yeah. yeah. Um. I, I'm not sure, uh, can we check the mic? Is it working, this one? Yeah. Is it working? Hmm. Mike, where are you? <laughs> yeah, should be. Hello? No, otherwise. <laughs> Thank you. Old fashioned microphone. Um, maybe what. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to actually I'm gonna jump to another topic, and I will be coming back to your topic in a minute. Um, that's what happens if you give away yeah, your if mic. If you give away <laughs> the mic, I <laughs> know it's uh, the trick. Yeah. Uh, because another elephant in the room is probably that. Once we capture this data and we get this guest to come to our hotel or this, this client, whatever, then we need to deliver. And uh, the expectations of our guests today, they're different as the expectations of our guests two years ago. And if we see that they're doing hybrid working, they're, doing, they're, they're becoming a pleasure guest, I mean, our digital equipment and our hardware and our data capacity in hotels, it needs to be good. And from my own experience, uh, I can... Well, I'm not going to give a couple of examples, but I've ex had a couple of experience over the last few months where you're in your hotel room and you're trying to download Netflix and you can't because the data capacity is not... I mean, you're like, really, is this 2022? Uh, so yeah, you're in a, you're in in a hybrid the, meeting. And uh, Yeah, exactly. I wanted to say in a business setting that that's even worse. Yeah. So you think, well, uh, we're, 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 um, we're so smart. We're going to do this hybrid meeting and it turns out to be a mess because, um, well, my microphone isn't working now, but imagine you have half of your audience in London, and, um, well, we have all been through two years of uh, Zoom and Teams, so I'm not going to repeat what's happening, but uh, it's, it's a nightmare. So uh, hotels, they will need to invest in their AV equipment, they will need to invest in their, uh, in their data delivery. Uh, super, I mean, it sounds very simple, but uh, it's not. No, no, you're totally right. So, so, so that data and tech part is something they need to invest in. Uh, we already all earlier also talked about the, the fact that uh, sustainability is important, also from the business client's uh, point of view. Um, are, are there any other things that um, you talk about with your hotels? Okay, guys, this needs to change or th this, this is coming. Keep this in mind. Well, s something we see because your original question was about, I think, uh, health and safety. Uh, we see an increased interest of our guests in health and safety. Um, but in the research we, we, uh, we did in, in January, 30% of our guests uh, are actually requesting enhanced standards for uh, health, cleanliness and safety. Mm. Uh, luckily, uh, a certain percentage is also willing to pay for it. So like 90% would be willing to pay for additional cleaning standards. At the moment, it is also certified. So it's not an empty promise. Um, something which is for hotel business probably more concerning is that I would say uh, pre-pandemic, hotels were selling many hotel rooms uh, on a non-refundable basis. They were selling hotel rooms on a, on a prepaid basis. So now everybody's expecting that they can uh, at, at least change, but ideally uh, cancel their booking until the day of arrival or um, they, would, uh, they would get their money back. Uh, do, do you see that also back in the bookings and the type of bookings that are made in your hotels? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, nobody is booking uh, um, a non-refundable rate anymore. 
and nobody is booking a prepaid rate anymore. Uh, I mean, from a hotel owners and from a hotel operator perspective, that's a problem. I mean, the moment you have this non-refundable booking in your books, it, it's there. You know what you can expect. You can schedule your staff. Um, you, you get your revenue uh, more or less uh, assured. Um, yeah, so that, 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 uh, that's an issue. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, so, so pre prepayment, cash flow wise for an owner, prepayment, you got, you got the money in the bank, sometimes already three, four months up front. Yeah. Um, uh, that's true. Um, and, and, and not only to, to stick to um, issues, um, I'm, I'm also looking for uh, some options to, um, to, to say to hoteliers things are going better as well. Um, <laughs> But <laughs> yeah, but I, also, I want to say yeah. on this because uh, there, there's obviously maybe there are also really opportunities uh, whereby people uh, want indeed more convenience uh, and you can really upsell uh, packages. I know that for example with KLM, I recently booked a ticket. You really have the, the, the different kind of packages that you can choose, which is really also a feel for me like it's personalization as well. And uh, tomorrow I'm going uh, to Paris. I booked a hotel there and they're sending immediately an email. Are you arriving by, uh, by car or by train or by uh, a plane? And can we pick you up somewhere for, uh, obviously I have to pay for it. But they give me this option. I thought, hey, this is pretty warm. So my girlfriend sent it to me like, hey, this is a good topic to use in your, in your panel conference. <laughs> but uh, actually, I think this is a great example of how you can really uh, have people feel more secure because maybe I'm really hesitant to travel with uh, the metro uh, uh, to the hotel, and this, they offer me an extra service, 65 euros uh, per person. No, that's a, a good, good added uh, value, I guess. So this goes also yeah. into the point of uh, personalization, I think. Uh, and, and maybe, Henri, uh, I know you have uh, ideas about personalization. Oh, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> I think um, many companies see personalization as the pinnacle of what they can do for customers. But personalization is, is, is a hygiene factor. And in many cases, when you look at uh, data-driven decisions, personalization may be, in fact, the wrong thing to do. Of course, when you are at a hotel, you want to be addressed as Mr. Robin. Nice to see you again. I love that. But it's not enough. And I think many companies see that as we can now personalize our emails, our address. That is sufficient. But, you know, when everybody does that, and before too long, everybody will do that, you have to find another way to take care of the customer, to show them that you know them. Now, with the uh, new cookie laws, where marketeers cannot just place any cookie uh, on your computer, and as a marketeer, I'm very happy about that. I like marketeers. I like marketeers to do something for a living and to get the customer better. So the opportunity that I see that if you do your marketing well, you can get to know your customer even better. So opportunities around. Opportunities around, exactly. Um, Aaron, getting back to you, because uh, we had some points where hotels need to invest in, in different things. Uh, wh what are the plus points that you um, can say to hoteliers? What, what's nice? The plus points, well, luckily there is more plus points as, uh, as challenges, uh, I would say. Um, I think we're still working in a blessed industry. Um, I think globally there is 7.7 .7 billion people in the world. Uh, actually, on, only one point three billion of them are active travelers. So that's not a lot, that's 15%. And previously our industry has been growing because this 1.3 billion active travelers was growing every year with 4.5%. Whereas accommodation was only growing with about 2%. So demand would outpace the offering. And uh, I think that's actually not going to change. That will come back, maybe not, maybe not this year, but it will come back. Yeah. So it will remain a blessed industry. Oh, well, that, that's a positive uh, <laughs> way to, to, uh, to end this. Um, I, um, I'm thinking actually of, of getting some questions in from the audience. Uh, sir, up front here, um, I will, well, <laughs> always afraid to give away a mic, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll join you here. <laughs> Yeah, I'm listening to your story and I see also a little bit of struggling between the business traveler and the, and the, the normal con consumers. Uh, you mentioned that the, the CO2 bu budget part and, and the, uh, the, the choose you have to make between the, the, the way of traveling and the way of staying. Uh, there's also an EU Green Deal with the taxonomy in part of it. Are you also um, seeing the impact of the CO2 price will coming here? also on the traveling and also on the way of traveling and the staying and the food and everything after that. Are you also measuring the impact on this on your daily stuff? Yeah, 
So, so trying to understand the consequence of the CO2 into your uh, yeah, uh, businesses. Yeah, I can, I can give an answer to that. So uh, uh, Google has a big uh, ambition to really lower the carbon emissions and really en help people by enabling uh, to make a conscious choice of how you're booking your next trip. So if you use, for example, Google Flights tool uh, to book your next trip, you can see the carbon emissions that uh, are uh, connected to that trip. So an example is, for example, if you want to fly to Paris, well, I would say take a train, but if you want to go to Paris, there is a different kind of options how you can fly. And it says, okay, the direct flight, this is how much carbon emissions this is costing. And if you take, for example, uh, a flight that has a derouting, uh, this is how much it costs. And you can really select on that. And in, I think it's also really a consumer responsibility uh, to be really aware and conscious of what, how you're booking your trip. If I may give an example uh, of that, um, at Accor, together with uh, Standard Hotel Management School, we have developed a net carbon calculator for food. Uh, so we will uh, shortly uh, publish in one of our restaurants the menu where you have your steak and you have your uh, whatever uh, uh, cod and you have your salad. And it would say what actually is the, 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 the carbon impact of the dish you're ordering. And we are experimenting now with nudging, you know. Uh, is it going to make a difference? Uh, well, it looks like it. That it's going to make a difference. Interestingly enough, the uh, the dishes with a low carbon output generally they're, they're the more healthy dishes, uh, and obviously, I mean they're they're less uh, impactful for the planet. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Oh, you have a follow-up question. <laughs> I also had an, an lecture about uh, the professor of Delft. He said it's also about refusing, and that is it's it's also uh, if he refuses to fly anymore for lectures all over the world. He was you it was you he was used to travel a lot, and he was also say practice with preach. I said I'm here sustainability professor. It can be true that I, I privately I do nothing. I don't fly, and 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 but business wise I fly all around the world. And he, he measures his impact. He said I refuse. And that's also, but it's, it's also the hard uh, 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 question. I think that's very hard. And I mean, uh, we probably all experienced during COVID over the last two years that um, um, video conferencing can be an alternative for some kind of transactional uh, uh, meetings you would have. But I mean, we couldn't do this trade show uh, online. And uh, there is a lot of meetings where people actually want to see each other face to face. It, it's important. I mean, I think video conferencing it would be an, an, uh, an add-on for for meetings but it will never replace face-to-face -face contact uh, uh, at all yeah. Yeah. so it's much more a conscious choice and sometimes it's needed sometimes it's not yeah good point any more questions it's what you say right so sometimes you can't make this choice you have to travel but i think also we should not forget that travel is really enriching people so it, I'm not a psychologist, but new experiences, uh, I guess that really contributed to a much more open mindset and uh, to a better person. So if you are traveling, <coughs> fine, but try to do it conscious. Take the train if you can or other public transport or otherwise try to offset your carbon emissions. But f not flying at all, yeah, I think uh, that's pretty uh, a respect for that. Uh, but if you can't, uh, yeah, redo it. Yeah, or, or combine your business and your leisure uh, all it. at once. Yeah, Even that's better. also possible, true. More questions from the audience? Here in the back. I trust you, I'll give you the mic. Thank you. Uh, I, I have a question to the panel uh, regarding how the booking trends changed. I think a lot of bookings still come in very short time. Do you think, uh, going back to what you said, that, uh, uh, yeah, prepaying for a reservation doesn't work anymore. Do you think that people really get used to booking really short distance and the booking window will stay that short? Or as business travel, international travel return, it will expand again as it was in 2019 and before? Well, th that is what we see now. I mean, bookings are extremely, extremely last minute. I mean, a, a, a very big share is actually booked between the day of arrival and two or three days uh, before arrival. Looking a bit further ahead, uh, today that's feasible because hotels are not really that, you know, uh, that's fully booked. Uh, the moment hotels will uh, get more and more fully booked again, 
and your favorite hotel, uh, you can't book it anymore. Probably the next time you wouldn't book two days in advance, but you would book two weeks in advance. So this trend will probably also reverse by itself. But, um, well, I, I, I think that the, um, the, the development we have seen now where bookings are made so last minute, it's probably also there to stay until a certain extent. We just don't know to which extent. Like there is many things we still don't know. And we were speaking about how will business travel bounce back? Uh, what will happen with non-refundable rates and prepaid rates? Well, I think it's still too, too soon to, to be very concrete on that. It's probably more prediction. But I think there's also two different answers also to your question. Huh? So if you look at the bookings that are happening right now or in this uh, year from 2022, there was a lot of last minute bookings. But I think you said it before, those were the revenge bookings. Those were bookings who were supposed to be happening in November, December. When people book, for example, their ski holiday. Uh, but yeah, obviously we did not know how bad Omicron would be. So people waited to book until really last minute and then they would do their booking. And on the other hand, you have much more longer term bookings now for coming summer. And I think if you are working in the hotel business, I would say, all right, try to make your uh, 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 offering as compelling as possible to the clients that you want to attract. Uh, so offer them really uh, uh, good terms in terms of cancellation or uh, uh, security measures so they feel comfortable to be booking. And also let the data speak for themselves. So this is the, this is the ultimate period where you can experiment with, with offerings and simply check whether people do different things. And you have the data, so just analyze them. Okay, a good enough answer for you, yes? Thumbs up, that's nice. More questions, maybe a last question. Okay, then, then I have a question for all three of you. Um, could you um, well, tell me what, what your biggest takeaway is of, of this uh, gathering together, where you thought, hey, I found that interesting. Uh, Mark, or Henry, or Erwin, who wants to start? <laughs> oh, thank you. I, I will have to start. Yes, yes. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Uh, my biggest takeaway is that um, well, I'm not an expert in the hotel business, but uh, when I see uh, people so passionately talking about the business and people passionately walking around, I think uh, that would be a, um, a nice new research subject for me. So that's, that's what I'd like to take away. Okay, well, then, then we should talk uh, in a later moment. We will, we will. <laughs> we will. Good. Mark? Yeah, so when I started working in the travel industry 13 years ago, people said, okay, you work in the travel industry, industry, it's the most resilient industry there is, right? People don't go on a trip now because they can't, it will always bounce back. And I think if I talk to you or when I see the questions or the people here attending and I talk to them, I think it is a quite a resilient strategy uh, or, or industry. Uh, so I would say really, yeah, uh, I, it really inspires me and uh, I would say, yeah, go for it. Uh, 2022 is going to be a lot better the year than last year. Okay, thank you, Mark. Erin? Well, I would say for all the um, bad things that COVID has been bringing us over the last two years, if I would need to name one thing that maybe it has been bringing us in a better way, um, it's, it's the, uh, the acceleration uh, of innovation in our business and also the acceleration in use of data. I mean, we have used the word data quite a few times uh, over the last 45 minutes, but um, I think historically speaking, hotel business has never been extremely innovative and it has never been uh, extremely digitized or data driven. And I think we all see the benefit now and it's gonna be actually a competitive benefit uh, if you actually master your data. Well, yeah, that, that's great. Uh, the, what I mainly hear now is, despite all the challenges, there's a lot of hope uh, that it will be better uh, and uh, that it will bounce back. Uh, and that actually we're going to go back to old behavior, as Henri already uh, that's said. That's right. So I think there will be plenty of opportunities. Good. So. Thank you very much. And I uh, would like to round off this session. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, AJ. Thank you, panel, for enlightening us and taking us towards the world of the post-pandemic. We're not there yet, as Erwin said, but we're getting there. Um, thank you very much for joining this session. We will recontinue at 3.30, uh, where we will have the start of a trend tour, which will take you over the, over the show and show you where the latest innovations are to be found. And then uh, 45 minutes later, we have the last discussion of today. 
Thank you for now and hope to see you back.